Good morning, Northline. Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. You guys ready? All right, clap it up. For the victory is won. Great is the Lord. Praise Him forevermore. Sing, dance like the shackles. Dance like the shackles are already done. The shackles the shackles. The victory is won. Praise the, the Lord. Praise Him forevermore. Sing, dance like the shackles. Dance like the shackles. Shackles of death, the shackles of 
we praise you today, we worship you. What a time in his presence. Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 says, Thank you, Lord. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns, spiritual songs. Sing and make music to give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think of that part, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. So Lord, we just thank you today that as we praise you, anything that's in our heart today, that God is, there's no room for music, we just lay it down to you today in Jesus' name. We praise you, God, we worship you, and we pray that you would be the lifter of our head, that you would be the strength of our life, that our trust and our hope today is in you. So anything, God, that we're laying down at your feet, we thank you that, God, you're being lifted up. You're being glorified. You're being worshiped in this place. And we're excited to see what you're going to do. So we praise you. We lift up our hands and we worship you right now. Father, we give you praise in this place. We worship you for you and you alone are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And even in tiredness in this place, oh, it's being lifted in the name of Jesus. Anything that's going on that we feel down today, oh, that Lord, lift every spirit, lift every heart because you're with us. So we give you praise as we worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Spirits are rushing in, fire of God, breathe within, Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent and turn from sin, revival and the smolder in, breath of God, fan us into we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven, for your spirit out, for your spirit
fragrance of heaven pour your spirit out pour your spirit out oh holy anointing the power of your presence pour your spirit out pour your spirit The Spirit of the Lord is in this room today. Um, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So let's worship the Lord and praise Him in freedom and in truth today. And let's just give Him everything. Let's just give Him our everything today. He deserves it all. So let's sing this out.
Sing that again. Worthy is your Let's just give him a shout of praise today. Give him our everything. Hallelujah. Let's just take a moment and just realize that God is with us. We praise you, Jesus. So there's a scene happening in heaven right now where angels, creatures that we have never seen before, elders, are gathered around the throne and they are singing that he is worthy, that he is holy. And we want to join in that course, right? All the days of our life, may we be doing what they're doing in heaven. God, you're worthy. You're holy. Something else is happening in heaven right now. Around the throne, in the throne room. And it's Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is our great high priest and that he intercedes for us. That blows my mind. One of the things that's happening in heaven right now is Jesus is bringing our request to the Father. He's bringing our needs. Our prayers rise up like incense, the Bible says. And so there's a couple ways that we can join in heaven's activities. One is we just worship God. We sing. We de declare that he's worthy, that he's holy. Sometimes we just kneel. Sometimes we just stand in awe. We're joining in heaven's activities. And the other thing that we do to join in heaven's activities is we do what Jesus does and what his Holy Spirit does is we intercede. We pray for people. And this morning, my heart is heavy for the nation of Yemen. Yemen is in the Middle East, just below Saudi Arabia. It's north of Ethiopia, across the Red Sea. And I was not aware of this until a, a prayer app pointed out to me this past week that Yemen has been in the middle of a civil war for the past seven years. Uh, there is a group called the Houthi. Houthi rebels have risen up and are at war with their government. 
In the past seven years, over 375,000 people have died from this war in Yemen. Over 11,000 children have died in Yemen. And when people die as Christians, we have the hope that of eternal life, right? We have the hope that I'm going to see someone again because they believed in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. In Yemen, 99.7% of people are Muslim. The main divisions in religious groups are just between the Sunni tribe and another, I'm, I'm blanking right now, the other Muslim tribe. Wikipedia actually says 99.9% are Muslim. The Joshua Project lowers it down to 07 There are about 1,000 believers in the entire country of Yemen. I don't know the statistic, but <laughs> if we would do math real quick. I mean, 375,000 people died, and the likelihood is that maybe 0.1% of them knew Jesus. That breaks my heart. So, today, I want us to intercede and to join with the Holy Spirit and Jesus in interceding for the people of Yemen. One, that this war would stop, but more importantly, that the gospel of Jesus would be proclaimed, that people would know the Savior, that God forbid, should the war continue, that there are people who know Christ when they pass. So can we just lift our voices together and pray for the nation of Yemen, for the people of Yemen? Father, I thank you that there is no people group under heaven that is hidden from you, there is no nation of which you are unaware. Your eye sees it all. And God, we know your heart breaks for the people of Yemen. I wasn't even aware of it until just recently. But you knew. And so, Father, we join with you now. We pray, God, that the people of Yemen would come to know Jesus. God, we ask that you would raise up missionaries, maybe even some in here today, to go to the nation of Yemen to bring the light of Christ, to preach the gospel of Jesus, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. We're able to be here and we're worshiping and we're standing in your presence and we have peace and we know joy. Those who do not know Christ do not know those things. They don't know the presence of God. So Father, would you raise up missionaries for this nation? Lord, would you send workers there? God, we pray as well for the nations of uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia who are involved in really escalating this conflict. God, we ask that people would turn to Christ. We've prayed this before and we'll keep praying. Jesus, would you just show up in their dreams? Lord, that they would hear of you even in, as they sleep. Lord, that they would know of you. God, we pray even for online ministries, Lord, that may be able to reach people without even going into the country. God, that people that the gospel would infiltrate Yemen that way. Lord, pray for transformation in these Houthi peoples, in the rebel leaders that are causing this war. We ask that they would come to know Jesus. Lord, we pray for the 99.7 or 0.9 percent of people in Yemen who are following Allah who believe Muhammad was a prophet above and beyond Jesus. God, we ask that you would show yourself true to them today. God, we thank you that, Lord, though we're going to say amen now, that our prayers continue to rise before you. We thank you, Lord, that this was already on your mind. It's already in your heart. So we just say, Lord, do it. Let it be done. May these people come to know you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stay standing for the reading of God's word this morning. The word of the Lord from Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40 says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Amen. You may be seated for your morning announcements. Our announcer needs no introduction, does she? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's always a beautiful time in the presence of God. I especially find myself these days uh, careful not to take these moments for granted. Amen. Just a couple of announcements for us. Some of you may know him as a former student body president, now evangelist Wesley Agrary. He is going to be lecturing in Professor Richie's Life and Ministry Evangelistic class on Friday, March 3rd from 9.30 to 10.45. So students are invited to attend and hear um, Evangelist Wesley as he has um, just wisdom to share about his new experiences in evangelistic ministry. So all are welcome, those who are part of that class and not. Um, also, we have town hall tonight at 8 o'clock. Everyone say 8. eight. Right here in the chapel. We're doing it a little bit different. So if you've missed town hall and don't know what it's about or have been to town hall and think you know what it's about, it's all going to be different tonight. So uh, we have a link on North Point's list that Tanner has put up for us. And you can go find that link and submit your questions there. We're doing it this way to provide um, some time for us to prepare for our answers for these questions. And we're also going to try to have different people here to answer your questions on the spot as opposed to me saying, oh, yeah, I'll go talk to that person. Oh, I'll go talk to that person. The hope is that these people would be able to answer your questions right then and there. So please come submit your questions. Even if you can't come submit your questions because it's helpful for the whole student body and for administration just to know where our heads and hearts are at. And so we hope you come out for that at 8 p.m. tonight. And there also is a survey in your email. So as always, check your email. Chloe sent out a survey for spring break, so don't fail to do that. And now, Pastor Josiah. Good morning. So uh, we just want to take a moment. And one of the things about college is that is unique is that it's a transitive. It's transitory, right? So four years, then you move on, things like that. And uh, today is uh, someone who already graduated. They went through the school, but they stuck around for a while. Uh, is their last day on campus. Uh, where is Nelijah? Nelijah, yeah. So, Nelijah, we just want to acknowledge that we are very thankful for you and uh, for your time here, even beyond graduation, and especially all your help in food services and everything you've brought to the campus. And so, Nelijah is going to be just seeking the Lord kind of for her next step and uh, moving in a different direction. So we're proud of you. We're thankful for you. And I just want to encourage you guys to make sure you say hi and bye to Nelijah today and uh, keep her in your prayers as she discerns God's next step for her. But Nelijah, we love you and just want to uh, say thanks for being here today. And now I'm going to introduce Dean Scott to introduce our speaker. <laughs> well, good morning. So I have the opportunity to introduce a friend. Um, and I would call him a friend. So when I came into the school as dean of students and, you know, not knowing many people in the Northeast, um, you know, it was important for me to get introduced to the district youth directors of the area, but also to some of our board of trustees. Well, our speaker today is both a member of our board of trustees and the district youth director of Northern New England. And I realized after talking to him a few times in person and then on the phone, Every time I left conversations with him, I felt encouraged. And I'm like, oh, is this a blossoming friendship? Because it's like when you get into ministry, especially when you move to a new ministry position, you still need friends. Uh, friends are so important. Friends who uh, maybe aren't in the same ministry, the same church, or even the same college, but who at least kind of understand that world. And especially uh, with his background in youth ministry, you know, it was, it was something I'm like, man, this could be somebody that I really enjoy talking to. And so uh, I, I would say now that we're friends and, and I'm excited about him and, and his involvement on this campus. So he is originally from the state of Georgia, which he is very much a college football fan. And so he is very proud of his national championship, Georgia Bulldogs. The Ohio State fans and Penn State fans are not happy right now. Um, <laughs> I'm a Mizzou fan. We're used to losing to Georgia, so it's okay. Um, uh, but he is from the state of Georgia and now serves as the district youth director in northern New England. And even next ministries, they've, they've gone the direction of 
you know, next ministry, uh, next gen ministry. And so he oversees all that. I had the privilege of speaking to some of his next gen pastors and leaders about a week or so ago and just had a blast with them. Um, not only that, he is, you know, if you're into video games, he's a huge gamer. In fact, he is very involved on a Assemblies of God nerd, um, nerd Facebook page. And so it's like, all right, this may be your guy. So if you love games, gaming, this could be your guy. If you love, you know, college football, this could be your guy. If you like, you know, Toyota Priuses, this could be your guy. <laughs> Although he looks like a lumberjack, he drives a Prius. Um, and so, but I have really enjoyed getting to know him. And also we celebrate with him that as of in the last couple of weeks, he and his wife have announced that he will soon take on the title of dad. Um, and so we are excited for him. So please join me in welcoming District Youth Director Travis Nicholson. Well, good morning. Good morning. I, uh, I'm thankful that uh, Michael sees me as a friend because I, I see him the same way. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, it would be really bad if I came up here and I was like, I don't like that dude at all. Uh, but it's ob obviously that's not true. Um, North Point is blessed to have Dean Michael Scott here, uh, as I'm sure many of you realize, just as you're blessed to have all of your deans uh, that serve this school so faithfully and willingly. Uh, it's a blessing to be here this morning. As he said, you know, I am into everything. There's, there's not really anything in this life I don't enjoy um, because I believe that God's created everything, uh, regardless of if it was a, a tree in the garden or a video game. God inspired someone with the creativity to create that video game. And so I enjoy everything uh, under the, the, the sun and just really have a great time. So I'm sure there's something that you and I can uh, find a common interest in at some point. So if you want to chat with me, I'm always available to chat. I'll, I'll be here pretty much all day almost. So if you want to chat at any time today, don't hesitate. But this morning I want to talk about blind spots. How many in here have their driver's license? Yeah, pretty much everyone, right? Uh, so... Uh, you, you know about blind spots in cars, right? Like you have to, uh, if, if you're changing lanes, you have to make sure to look behind you because if you don't, you're probably going to hit a car and it's not going to end well. On my way here, actually, uh, I went through like three different wrecks and the whole time I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm talking about blind spots this morning and I guarantee you every single one of those people did not check their blind spot. Um, but we got here safely. And, uh, and so this morning I want to talk about blind spots, not obviously in vehicles, but primarily in, uh, in, in our life, because I believe there's blind spots in, in each of our lives. But before I do, I want to share a story about something close to my, the, the town I live in. I live in a very small town called Lisbon, Maine, but right outside of Lisbon is a, in a, in an area called Auburn, Lewiston. All right, maybe you've heard of that, just north of Portland. There we have a Walmart. And recently, as of just a few weeks ago, but even before then, since I moved to the area, we have this uh, pretty uh, big celebrity uh, at Walmart. And it's, it's, it's not a human. It's not an animal. In fact, it's this, it's this inanimate object. It's this pole at Walmart in Auburn, Maine. And there's a, there's a Facebook dedicated to it with thousands of people uh, in this Facebook group. But the reason why there's uh, a following for this poll is because there's something unique about it. And it's this. And how? Exactly. <laughs> right? Like, how? So someone ran into that poll, either on accident or on purpose. I don't know. But someone ran into that poll and, and you know, it... Someone took a photo of it, it got posted, uh, people asked that question, how? And then, you know, maybe a couple weeks ago, a couple months later, you know, at some point later, this happened. It's the same poll. Once again, how? It looks like they ran into it and just decided to, hey, we're just going to keep on driving. And then, a couple weeks later, Maybe a couple months later, maybe even just a couple days later, this happened. 
once again, someone running into the pole. And you can even see it pulled up the pavement this time. And so every time someone runs into this pole, someone takes a photo of it. And I'm not joking when I say there's probably at least 50 to 100 different instances where this pole has been hit by a vehicle. I, I edited this photo so we could zoom in on the car. But if you were to find this original photo, I forgot to include it in my slides, but if you were to find this original photo and zoom out, the, the, the most ironic thing is right on that Walmart facade on the building, uh, it literally says Walmart Vision Center right behind the car. Uh, obviously, they need it, but it just keeps happening. And so there's been studies. People have been questioning, why does this keep happening? Uh, people, there's some people that believe that this pole has its own gravitational pool. That just, it just brings everyone into it. Uh, some believe that, you know, people just aren't paying attention, which is probably part of it. But they've done studies and they've found that the primary reason why people keep running into this pole at Walmart is because of A-frame blind spot. So an A-frame in your vehicle, that is like that little piece of car in between your windshield and your door. All right, does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's, it's like, it's honestly the most annoying thing because it's the one thing that blocks you from seeing something that you need to see. And, and in this case, it tends to block people who need to see this pole. And this isn't a small pole, it's a pretty big pole. But it just so happens to be the perfect width and it stays behind this A-frame. And so people just keep on hitting it and hitting it, and hitting it, and it causes tons of damage, it causes tons of trauma, and it's, it's really, really funny to look at, but at the same time, you know, God's kind of shown me through something silly like this Walmart pole, right, what A-frame in our life, what blind spot in our life is something that's always there, that we maybe don't fully notice, that's causing us to, to, to detour off the path, that's causing us to run into obstacles, that's causing us pain and trauma, and, and sometimes what feels like e irreparable damage. And so this morning, I really want to look at three different mindsets for you and I as believers. When I look at the American church, when I look at specifically the New England church, when I look at myself and students and leaders, these are probably the, the three mindsets that are, are probably the, the largest and most noticeable blind spots in our lives. I believe there could be far, far more than just the three that I list. But these three are, are, are probably the, the, the biggest three. And so sometimes I think really all we need is just a, a shift in the way that we think. And so I'm going to present three mindsets that some of us may currently have and the mindsets that we should change into, that we should shift into. And so the first one is what I call the one mindset versus the 99 mindset. So as Bible students, hopefully you all know the parable of the one in the 99. But just in case you haven't been studying your classes, I'm going to read it for you. So it's found in uh, Luke chapter 15, verse 1 through 7. Verse 1 says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. This passage here, I think, paints a perfect picture of where I think many of us can sometimes slip into. And what I mean by that is it is easy for us to view ourselves as the one. And I fully believe that all of us in this room at one time was the one. Next day or next week. We're in kids service and, 
and they ask, hey, if anyone wants to give their life to Christ, raise your hand. <laughs> I want to give my life to Christ. All right, if anyone gave their life to Christ, come pick a prize out. All right, don't mind if I do. Walk up to the prize count. I will take that the next week. Anyone need to give their life to Christ? This guy. This guy needs to give his life to Christ. I probably did it for like 10 to 12 weeks before the, anyone really caught on. That or they were just being really nice. It was probably the latter. But I just kept saying, I, I need to give my life to Christ. I need to give my life to Christ. I need to give my life to Christ. As a teenager, the same thing happened. I grew up in a very charismatic church. The Holy Spirit was in the room and his presence was evidence every time we got together. And every Sunday night at youth group, the pastor would preach, you know, if you need to give your life to Christ, come down front. I'd come down front weeping and crying. And I need to give my life to Christ. Next week, if you need to give your life to Christ, come down. I mean, I was probably saved over and over uh, countless times, hundreds of times. Because there, there, there's a part of us that does feel broken, that does feel in need of a Savior, because we need a Savior. But if we've given our lives to Christ, 2 Corinthians is true. Chapter 5, verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. The one has passed away. The 99 has come. You once were the one, but now you are the 99. If we live our life constantly saying, we need, we need, we need, we need, we're going to miss out on those. We're going to pass by those in our community. We're going to pass by those in our, in our schools. We're going to pass by those even in our own churches who need a touch from Jesus Christ because we're saying, no, no, I need, I need, I need. And so I'm not saying don't chase after your God. Please hear me. Chase after Christ. Chase after God with, 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 with a passion that's unrelenting. But have the attitude of I am victorious in Christ. Have the attitude of nothing that I face will harm me. Nothing that I've done in my past will come back. Because through Christ, I'm victorious. Through Christ, he has already saved me. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. When we continue to view ourselves as someone who is lost after we've been found, it creates a blind spot in our lives. The second one, before I really get into it, I, I, I want to preface it with this. God had been working on this message in, in, in my life for about six to eight months. All right, so... This next one I'm going to talk about, it's going to seem like, oh, it's just because of current events, but it's not. This is something that God's been working in my life, and it's this. It's that some of us need to move past a revival mindset into an awakening mindset. So it's the revival mindset versus the awakening mindset. I, I, I want to share what I believe is the difference between a revival and an awakening. Because they're two very, very different things. I think what we're seeing in Asbury or, or, or what we saw in Asbury and what we're seeing in countless areas, uh, even as close as Wyndham, New Hampshire, at a local church up there, are, are revivals. And I don't discount revivals in, in any way, shape, or form. I think revivals are needed. Since I was a, 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 a teenager, since I was a young adult, when I moved up to New England, all I have heard from pastors and leaders is we need revival. Pray for revival. Pray for revival. And so, you know, I adopted that. We need revival. Pray for revival. We need revival in New England. And when I became district youth director, I believed that revival was going to come to New England, but I believe it was going to come through the teenagers and the young people of this region. And so we made shifts and we changed our youth convention to Revive Youth Conference to make sure that we kept that revival on the forefront of our mind. But here's what God's kind of been working in me. Over, I'd, I'd say this, he's really been working in me over the past year. And it's this, it's that revival is already here. Because there's a difference between revival and an awakening. A revival is something that the church 
must experience. A revival is something for the church to bring them back into full relationship with God for the bride of Christ to be fully intended the way that she was created to be. That's what a revival does. It brings us back. And that's what we need in the church. But a revival doesn't have to happen on this grandiose scale. A revival can happen right here, right now, where you're at. It can happen in your bedroom. It can happen in your dorm room. It can happen at the, at the lunch table. It can happen in the hallways. Revival doesn't have to look like it does everywhere else. Revival is us individually, sometimes corporately, but making a decision that we're going to fall back in line with how God created us to be. And we're going to fall back in line into that full relationship with him. As I said, I believe that what's happening in Asbury and what, what, what is happening across are revivals. And people are, are flocking to the university. They're, they're flying to all these other locations to discover or rediscover that love for him again. But I believe what happens next, what happens after revival is paramount. Because, as I said, a revival is for the church. A revival is entirely dependent on ourselves, our hunger for God. You can experience revival right where you're seated, but you have to choose it. And I think I've seen this in our youth groups in northern New England. I think I've I, I can honestly say that even just sitting there, there is a different hunger in this room than the previous times I've been here. And so I, I would even argue that many of you are experiencing a personal revival in your own life. That you've rediscovered a hunger for God that maybe you had as a teenager or a young person and that maybe you put on a shelf somewhere, but God's brought you back. A revival is entirely dependent on us. What happens next is paramount because an awakening, on the other hand, is entirely dependent on God pouring out his spirit from the calls of the people who have experienced revival. And I can show you how this works in a couple different ways. The first is, is a, a, a real life, not too long ago experience. Many of you were probably definitely not alive during this. Some of you may have been. But that is the Jesus movement. Maybe you've seen the previews for the Jesus Revolution movie. Maybe you've seen the Jesus Revolution movie. Maybe you haven't. For those that don't know anything I'm talking about, basically there's a movie that's out right now called Jesus Revolution, and it's all about the Jesus movement. It's all about Chuck Smith and Lonnie Frisbee. Who, who are these uh, big names in, in creating a movement that swept across the country. Now, I'm not getting into who they were as men. <clears throat> we're, not, we're not doing that. The movie doesn't do that. We're not going to focus on the men, but we're going to focus on the God that worked through these men. Who were flawed, who made mistakes. But God chose to pour out his spirit. Because Chuck Smith, who was a pastor of just a, a, a small local church called Calvary Chapel, through Lonnie Frisbee, through his daughter, all of a sudden experienced this personal revival. And he's brought back into that full alignment with God of saying, I want to hunger after God. I want to reach the lost. And so all of a sudden, he starts inviting these hippies. Some former drug addicts, some current drug addicts into his church, not wearing shoes, not looking the way that people expect them to look, making a mess. And revival begins to take place because of what happened in one person's heart, and then a second person's heart, and then a third person's heart. And all of a sudden, that revival turns into an awakening. And you have droves of people that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ glorified, giving their lives to Christ. And this is what marks an awakening different from a revival, is if it impacts the culture. A revival will impact the church, but an awakening will impact a culture. And the Jesus movement impacted our culture. 
If you were alive during that time, you know what happened afterwards. Laws were put into place. The governments were changed because of what happened in a small church in California. An entire culture was forever changed. And I hear New England, I hear people across our country saying, we need revival, we need revival. Listen, revival is going to change the church 100%. But what we need is an awakening to sweep across this country. What we need is an awakening for, for, for your friends and your family who maybe have never heard the name of Jesus Christ glorified all of a sudden to experience God's spirit poured out. We are sitting in a place, state, where the first, second, third great awakenings happened. And in the entire culture of the baby nation was formed. We're in a place where an awakening can happen, but we have to move past wanting revival. Once again, revival is not a bad thing, but we have to move past and realize that, yes, you and I need a personal revival in our lives, but what we need, what our country needs, what our friends need, what our family need is an awakening. You need to feel Jesus' spirit, God's spirit poured out into this country. I think we can even see it in the Bible, in Acts chapter 2. All right, we we all know Acts chapter 2. As Pentecost, this is the cornerstone of our belief. What happened on that day was God's pouring out his spirit for the first time. And we can see it in the first four verses. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place, Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared in each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. This is an outpouring of God's Spirit, yes. And so this would be marked as, what I just said, an awakening. However... Before this awakening happens, we see revivals take place personally within the lives of the disciples. And how do I know this? Well, because who is probably the most known during this time, and that's Peter. We see the apostle Peter do something. Just a few chapters before, in, in, in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter denies Christ three times. Walks away from ever knowing who Christ was. Steps out of that alignment with Christ. Steps out of that, that, that love that he so said that he had. But something within him caused him to take a step back. Well, then all of a sudden this personal revival happens within his life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus Christ. And we see that Peter is brought back into alignment He's brought back to his first love. He's brought back to that knowledge of who Christ is. And he experiences something that paves the way for an awakening to take place. Because at the end of Acts chapter 2, verses 40 and 41, it says, Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added that day, about 3,000 in all. Many of you may know this, maybe, maybe don't, but many believe that that's just 3,000 men. That's not including the, the women and the children. So you could look at 5,000 plus being added that day because of a revival that took place in Peter's heart, that, 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 that took place within, that urged him through the outpouring of God's spirit to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel for the first time. And I think it's easy to say that a culture was impacted that day and that the start of the church that we know today was born. And so we don't just need a revival. We need an awakening. I believe revival has already taken root in many of our lives. 
Some of us just have to go past that one mindset into the 99 mindset and realize that, that who I am in Christ does not have to change. The revival can st stick with us. It's not something we pick up and put down. It can stay with us. And then we can usher in an awakening in Haverhill, in Massachusetts, in Connecticut, in Rhode Island, in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. We can see it. A shift needs to take place in our minds past revival into an awakening. And so this last one, this, this morning that I want to talk on, is a little different because I, I believe the first two, the one mindset, the 99 mindset, the revival mindset, the awakening mindset, all of these are, are really sort of dependent on ourselves. Having to shift our minds, having to change, and, and, and really it affects ourselves, right? It, it affects how strongly and how fervently we serve Christ. But this next one, I believe, really affects God and, and, and in a way can limit God. And it's this, it's the why not here mindset versus the it starts here mindset. I think a lot of times when we see something like what happened in Asbury and, 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 and what, when we see something that happens in, in churches down the road or down the street, it's easy to ask God, why not here? Why not here? And maybe some of you as students thought that, maybe some of you as professors thought that, maybe some of you as faculty thought that, why not here, God? Why not at this place? But the question shouldn't be, why not here? Now, I understand why this question asks. It's an easy question to ask. Because we, we all want to experience this. We all want to be the reason why revival happens. We all want to be the reason why an awakening happens. But I believe this is the biggest blind spot that's facing you and I this morning. Because as I said, this isn't something that limits ourselves. We're putting a limit on what God can do. As Dean Michael Scott said, I'm from Georgia, born and raised. Grew up there. For those that don't know Georgia, it is like Bible central, right? Like I tell people all the time, for every Dunkin' Donuts we have here, there's a church in Georgia. And it's true. I mean, like, you, what, Route 1 here, you have like six Dunkin' Donuts within maybe 50 feet of one another. It's the same in Georgia. You got like 17 churches all on one street. And it's all like the first, second, third Baptist, first, second, third Assembly of God, you know. But there's so many churches. Grew up in that culture. Grew up in that, that, that area. I'd say, uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, 65, 67% of Georgia, if not more, uh, consider themselves to be born-again Christians, to consider themselves uh, evangelical. And so that's the culture I grew up in. When I was 17 years old, 16 years old, and God called me to be a youth pastor, and then when I graduated high school at 18, not knowing where to go, we had someone visit from uh, a church in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, he was visiting our church in Georgia, and he said this. He said, Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire are the top three most unchurched states. And I remember hearing that at the time and thinking, wow, that's got to be weird. Like, I should go up there. I should check it out. And so that's what I decided to do. I felt God calling me up to the New England area, even though my parents fought me, even though my friends fought me. Even though everyone around me didn't want me to come up here, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a shot. I'm going to check it out. I came up here, and I was scared to death. You guys are mean. <laughs> not really. You're not as mean as everyone told me you were going to be. I mean, maybe here in Mass, uh, northern New England's a little nicer. I'm just kidding. Uh, but for real, I, I came, and, and I was, it was culture shock. Because down south, it's not uncommon for everyone you know to go to a church. Everyone in your school to go to a church. Here, it was almost the opposite, where most people didn't go to church. It wasn't something most people did. And so I remember questioning, like, what in the world is going on here? Why is this the case? And the, the more time I spent here, I've now lived up here 
a long time, not, not that long, but it feels like it, 11 years, 12 years, 13 years, 13 years uh, this year that I will have now lived in uh, the New England area. And what I've noticed is, yes, you guys may not have as many churches as down south. All right, let's just be honest. You may not have as many people that claim to be Christians as down south. But what you have is those here that do claim to be Christians are fully on fire for God. Because here it's not cool to go to church. Like, like down south, everyone goes to church because it's a cool thing to do. What's everyone do on a, on a Wednesday night? We all go to youth group because that's what everyone does. Here, no, no, if, if you're a student and you're going to youth group, you're probably the only one in your school that's going to youth group. And so the fact that you're doing that, the fact that you students here are going to a Bible college shows your passion for God. And that's needed. But we have to go past this why not here mindset. We have to stop saying, oh, woe is us. You know, why not here, God? Why can't you do what you're doing over there, here? Why can't you do what, what, what you're doing in these universities here? Why can't you do what, like, even comparing ourselves to AG universities, comparing ourselves to other AG churches in the area. It's not about that. We have to stop saying why not here and truly believe that it starts here. Matthew 9, many of you have probably heard this verse, Matthew 9, 37, where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says this. He says, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. I've heard this verse so many times since living up here. From pastor to pastor to superintendent to district youth directors, everyone saying, Listen, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. We need more workers. Woe is us. I almost feel like this verse is written on the tombstone of New England. Because we hold on to this and, and, and we, we walk about saying, oh, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We're tired, we're tired, we're tired. And I get it. Some of you students, you're just getting started. Some of the leaders in here, you've been here for a while, and you're tired. Some of you students may get to a point where you're tired. Some of you may be tired now. But what God is saying isn't just, oh, woe is us. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Yes, we are sitting, in case you don't know this, let me enlighten you. You are sitting in the number one most unchurched state in our country, Massachusetts the number one most unchurched state in our country. It's tied with New Hampshire for number one. Maine and Vermont are tied for number two, and I believe Connecticut and Rhode Island aren't too far behind. So New England is one of, if not the most unchurched region in our country. And so it's easy for us to look at it and say, woe is us, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Especially when we look at Georgia, and, and they're probably saying, Oh, woe is us, the workers are plentiful, but there's no harvest. You know, they're not really saying that. But it's easy for us to assume that that's probably what they're thinking. But we need to change that mindset. We need to go from not a why not here mindset, but it starts here. Not a woe is us, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But hallelujah, praise God, the harvest is plentiful. There's so much to go around. Yeah, the workers are few. There's only a few of us, but man, oh, man, are we strong. Man, oh, man, are we, are, are we working together. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few, but we are all in this together. Because we believe what Ephesians 3.20 says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. It's through his mighty power. And we focus so much on this verse, right? Matthew 9, verse 37. And I don't think I've ever, honestly, I mean this, ever heard a sermon where a pastor uses verse 9, 37, and then they use the next verse. I, like, 
Matthew 9.38 does not get nearly as much screen time or stage time as Matthew 9.37 does. Because we like to feel weary. We like to feel like the one that needs saving. Matthew 9.38 says this. It says, so pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. We say, woe is us, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Listen, it's not our harvest. It's not. It's his. He's the Lord of the harvest. Your friends, your family, that's not your harvest. That might be your harvest field that you work in, but it's not your harvest. It's his. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. But don't be surprised when you ask him to send more workers to the field and he turns around and says, okay, go. Because that's the reality of where we're at. We need to ask saying, why not here? Because the moment we push past why not here and start believing it starts here, we turn into those workers. We turn into those workers who are ready to go into the harvest, no matter how much of a harvest there is, no matter how hard we may have to work, and we work and we get tired, but we work. And we stand beside our brothers and our sisters and we lift them up and together we work. Because if it can happen in Georgia, it can happen in Massachusetts. If it can happen in California, it can happen in Maine. The same God that they serve is the same God that we serve. And if it can happen there, it can happen here. So it's not just about why not here. It's about it starts here. It starts now. And so as I close, if if the worship team wants to come up, I think it's easy for us to sometimes sit through a message like this and think, okay, yeah, that's all good. You know, that stuff doesn't, it just doesn't really affect me. And and, and maybe you're right. Maybe the the, the things I talked about, like I said, I believe this this affects the church on a macro level. It might not be affecting you on on the micro level of, of you as a student or you as a leader. But there's other blind spots in your life. For some of you, it might be the blind spot of position versus influence. You want a title. You want to be a pastor. You want to be the youth pastor. You want to be the kids pastor. But in in reality, God's calling you just to serve the kids that you have influence over right now. To influence the church that you're serving at right now. You know, for some of us, our blind spots look different. We all have different blind spots, and it's easy for us to take a second and say, well, you know, I don't think all of this really matters too much. But it matters because it blocks us from being fully aligned with God. And at some point, that blind spot is going to cause us to veer off track, to veer off the path that God has for us, and to run into an obstacle. And then we ask ourselves, God, why did you put this obstacle in front of me? You know, I can imagine the people that run into that pole at Walmart. They probably get pretty upset. And they probably write to Walmart, corporate, say, hey, you guys are putting this pole here. You need to change this. You need to fix this. And so Walmart probably gets all their staff together and they say, okay, what can we do? Well, I'll tell you what they did. They had this idea. They said, let's put this giant, I mean, when I say giant, I mean huge, giant green cover over this pole. It's bright. It's green. No one's going to miss it. But look what happens. So people are still running into it. And they say, what in the world, Walmart? We asked you to fix this. Why is it still like this? And so Walmart... They all get together. They say, okay, we got to fix this. How do we fix this? Here we go. We'll do this. And they put these giant concrete barriers. I took this photo myself just a few weeks ago. I was going to Walmart, walking in, and I was like, what in the world are these? Giant concrete barriers. This happened two hours later. And I'm not joking. 
Because I sent it to my wife, and I said, how long do you think these will last? And she said, who knows? And I get home, and she shows me someone has already posted it on Facebook. By the time I got home, someone ran into them. Why? Because it's not Walmart's responsibility to fix their blind spot. It's not Walmart's responsibility to make them look and be aware and to focus. So many of us are going through this life and we find ourselves running to obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And we're asking God, why, God, did you put this obstacle here? God, I need you to protect me from this obstacle. So he says, okay, fine. I'll help you out a little bit. Here you go. And then you find yourself in that same obstacle again. God, why, why, why do I keep running into the same thing? Why do I keep struggling with the same thing? Because at some point, we have to realize it's not God's fault that we keep running into that obstacle. It's not God's responsibility to keep us from that obstacle. We have the responsibility to look past our blind spots. We have the responsibility to examine our lives. What are the things that are separating you and I from Christ this morning? What are the things that are stopping us from being fully in line with who God wants us to be? How can we look past it? How can we change it? Some blind spots, are, they're going to be there. You can't take an A-frame out of a car. You can't. It's going to be there. That blind spot is going to be there. But how can I work around it? How can I be faithful and look around it? How can I change my life to make sure that those obstacles in the way, I swerve around them? And so my hope this morning is this isn't a, a hard message. This isn't a, a woe is us message. But this is a hopeful message because I believe many of us have been walking in this life defeated when we need to realize that Jesus was already victorious the moment he died on that cross and the moment that he raised from the grave. Nothing that you and I experience in this life has any hold on who we are. Nothing you've done in your life can separate you from who God is. He has already done enough. And I hope it's a hopeful message because you realize that God is not done yet. Whether you're a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, a senior, you're getting ready to graduate, maybe it's your last day. I hope you know that God is not done yet. That he wants to use you. He's ready to use you. And that Haverhill, that Mass, that, that New England can experience an awakening because revival is already here. And we just have to walk in it. We have to step in it. And I hope this is a hopeful message because we're reminded that the same God that raised Jesus from the grave, the same God that parted the Red Sea, the same God that empowered Peter, all those years ago is the same God that lives in you and me this morning. And it's the same God that will empower us to be the difference makers that we want to see. And that if he can do it there, he can do it here. And so it starts right now, this morning, today, and forevermore. So God, I thank you. I thank you, Father, for who you are. I thank you, God, that you've done more than enough for us. God, but I pray, Lord, that you give us the strength to look past our blind spots, that you give us the strength to look past those areas in our lives that sometimes will, will trip us up, to run us into obstacles. God, I pray, Lord, that you reveal to each and every one of us that we are a new creation in you. That the old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. God, reveal to us, God, that you are birthing revival in our hearts so that we can usher in an awakening into this culture. 
And God, may we rest in the knowledge of your power that you have already done it. And the same God that has done it will do it again. And that we know, Lord, that what we are praying for, that we, what we are wanting to see may not be happening yet, but it starts here and it starts now. God, we worship you this morning. We praise your name this morning. God, may you have your way above all else as we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.